Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart. Welcome guys and gals to the Mobile Home Park Academy's weekly podcast, where we'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bob, and today's show is a special treat that I'd like to share with you. Last week, we hosted the very first mobile home park town hall webinar, where I was joined by a panel of industry experts, where we discussed the state of our industry as it relates to the corona pandemic. And this first webinar was such a hit with more than a thousand registered attendees that we've decided to host these events every two weeks for the coming months to ensure that you're kept abreast of the latest industry news as it relates to mobile home park investing. And so mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 19th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time for our next event. Additionally, every webinar will be unique in that we're going to be rotating these industry experts uh, each and every two weeks to ensure that you're getting new perspectives every time. Now to get signed up, you can simply use the registration link that's provided in the show notes. And so guys, I'm super excited to get on to the recording of this last webinar. But before we do, I have a few quick housekeeping items. First and foremost, I tend to forget this sometimes, but I just want to make mention of it to ensure that you are fully aware that we are in active buying mode. We're always in active buying mode. And so we love paying big finders fees. Sunrise Capital Investors, our investment firm, is willing to pay upwards of $250,000 for any deals that are brought our way that meet our acquisition criteria. Uh, Simply put, we want to buy deals and we want to pay you for helping us find deals. If you've got a deal that you're looking at and it's at least 80 lots in size or larger and it's off market, meaning it's not listed by a broker or uh, it's not on LoopNet or Crexy or one of the other major listing sites, you can reach out to me via our website, which is sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Let's go to the contact us page and drop me a message. Again, we're willing to pay big finders fees, bigger bigger than most companies out there uh, if you find us a deal that meets our acquisition criteria. Again, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com, go to the contact us page and drop us a line if you have an opportunity for us to take a look at. Uh, moving on here, I want to remind you of the free gift that we offer all listeners who take the time to leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. We will give you the exact cold call script that we use in our very own mobile home park business. And we purchased about half of our $75 million portfolio from our cold calling efforts. And so if you're serious about getting started in this business or taking your existing business to the next level, then you really need to be cold calling park owners directly. And this cold call script will put you on your path to success. To redeem this free gift, simply send an email to gift at mobilehomeparkacademy.com and just tell us who you are and what screen name that you use to leave your review. And we'll go ahead and send that free gift out to you. And so, guys, that's all I have. And so without further ado, let's get on to the show. I just want to start by by welcoming everybody uh, to the inaugural Mobile Home Park Town Hall webinar brought to you by Sunrise Capital Investors. And um, I have to say that I'm absolutely thrilled and, you know, we're absolutely thrilled to to be here with each and every one of you here today. And um, uh, the date is Wednesday. It's May 6th. And as of today, and depending on you know, really what part of the country you're in, you know, we're, we're approximately six to eight weeks into this coronavirus mm-hmm. pandemic. And, um, and I, I think it's safe to say that for pretty much most of everyone on this call, uh, that our life has been significantly impacted, you know, one way or another due to the, the, the pandemic. And so, you know, we're here today to talk about the coronavirus, but, you know, more specifically, how it's directly impacting the manufactured housing space and you know, how we as, as owners and operators and investors can uh, you know, essentially navigate these uncharted waters and, and make sound financial decisions as we move forward here. And so with me here today, we have three industry experts uh, who, have been, who have been deep in the trenches. And um, uh, you know, w- those three are, oops, give me a second here, just had a little technical difficulty. 
apologize, guys. Um, and those three are James Cook, we've got Chris San Jose, and we've got Scott Belsky. And, you know, in a few minutes, I'll actually have each one of the, uh, the panelists give a little background or bio about themselves and, you know, where, where they fit in within the, the industry itself. And um, real quick, you know, before we get rolling here, I just want to give everyone kind of an overview of what the agenda of this webinar is going to look like. And so we've got a number of prepared questions that we're going to discuss directly with our panelists. And, and then once we get through uh, those, you know, already prepared questions, we have you know, set aside approximately 20 or 25 or so minutes that we're going to open up the Q&A, you know, to all the attendees so that you can simply just type in uh, your question in the Q&A box uh, that you see on your screen. And, you know, things are literally changing on a daily basis with this virus. And, and we're committed here as a company, as individuals to essentially run these events every week uh, to keep you, or not every week, every other week, to keep you guys abreast and, and up to date so that you can make educated and informed decisions within your business, right? I mean, that, that's the objective here is to, to help keep everyone up to speed with what's going on and the, the, the many changes that are coming at us day in and day out. And so uh, with that, guys, uh, what I'd like to do is just go around and, and give each of the, the panelists, you know, again, approximately 30 seconds or a minute or so to just provide a brief bio of themselves and then we'll dive right into the questions. So James, I'm going to throw it to you, brother, if you want to go ahead and, uh, and start it off. Uh, Kevin, thanks for, for hosting this. It's, a, it's really a pleasure joining you and you got a great group of panelists, um, you know, really honored to join. So uh, James Cook, founder of uh, Yale Realty and Capital Advisors. We're a national brokerage and uh, financing advisory uh, focused on the manufactured housing and RV uh, resort industry. So that's kind of what I live and breathe. I started in this industry somewhere around uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I took my first listing on a manufactured home community, uh, fell in love with the industry, realized it's a great place to, uh, a great investment asset class and uh, like the asymmetrical kind of nature of it um, and uh, have really enjoyed working with hopefully uh, plenty of your, your uh, you know, viewers tonight and, and uh, hopefully many more in the future. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, th thanks for that, James. Appreciate it, and glad that you're here, brother. Um, and Chris, why don't you go ahead next, bud? Sure. So I do work with James. I'm the president of the lending division for Yale Realty and Capital. We've been financing parks uh, full time since 2011. Um, we've financed about 800 million in mobile home parks thus far, all around the country, ranging from Florida all the way to Alaska. Uh, represent all the different buckets uh, buckets of capital that are available to the industry. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, life insurance companies, CMBS, banks, and credit unions. Um, we've worked on small deals, large deals, and feel like we have a good understanding of what the landscape of financing has been like over the last decade and how that's evolved over the last few months. And obviously, we're all kind of on the same train, gauging day by day how things are changing. So excited yeah. to share some of that intel with you guys today. Yeah, great, great. Thanks for being here, Chris. And uh, last up, uh, Scott, tell us a little about yourself, bud. Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin, for putting this on. Um, I'm Scott Belsky, work for Jones Lang LaSalle, um, also known as JLL. Um, JLL is an international real estate firm um, providing a wide range of commercial real estate services. Um, within JLL, um, I work in our um, valuation advisory business line in the United States, where I serve as the national practice lead uh, for manufactured housing communities and RV resorts. Um, our valuation line uh, as a whole has 200 plus uh, valuation experts um, scattered throughout the country and in, in providing uh, valuation services on all different types of assets. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you again, Scott, for being here. And, uh, you know, folks, uh, for those that aren't familiar with, with me, I'm Kevin Bupp and I'm a Prince Wet Sunrise Capital Investors. And, uh, you know, we're a boutique real estate investment firm that specialize in, in mobile home parks and also parking lot investments. And, um, in addition to our investment activity, I'm also the, the host of two different podcasts, uh, one being the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast. been doing that one for about six years now, which is a, a commercial-based investment show. And then I'm also the host of the Mobile Home Park Investing podcast. And so, again, just for folks that aren't familiar with me. And so, look, guys, again, appreciate having each and every one of you here. Very much looking forward to this. You know, we've got a lot of talent on this call. Uh, again, folks that are, you know, literally in the trenches day in and day out. And so very excited to, to get on with it here. And what I'd like to do is that, uh, James, I want to start with you, buddy. You're going to be in the hot seat uh, as we get rolling here. Yeah. And what I'd like for you to do, uh, you're not wearing a hat right now, but I want you to put on your, your invisible brokerage hat. And, you know, I, I want you to, to, to talk with us about, you know, uh, again, and this is related to like the last two months, right? Like everything that has happened over these last two months as it relates to the pandemic. And so, 
Tell us exactly what you're seeing as far as material changes within the industry, uh, but more specifically, things that relate to uh, items such as you know, pricing changes, uh, buyer and seller expectations, um, you know, retrades, decreasing, you know, decreasing listings, what have you. And I know that that's a multi-tiered question, but I just yeah. want to hear from you, know, fr- from you, what are those large material changes that have been playing out thus far? You know, we're uh, we're relatively early in this thing. Uh, actually, uh, I know it feels like it's been uh, ten years of our life without, <laughs> for a lot of people, staying home. Uh, for some of us, which travel was part of our weekly routine and uh, all that, uh, it, it it does feel like it's been a while. But um, <clears throat> you know, I, I have I was looking at some transactions we were negotiating in early February, and. Um, you know, some of those transactions have came to fruition and have proceeded and are now closing. And some of those transactions uh, did did come apart almost due to uh, the, uh, the the COVID pandemic. Um, so it's 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 interesting. I would say that um, I think you know your, your kind of list of questions there. You know, in terms of pricing changes, we haven't seen. You know, I don't think we've seen the full effects of COVID on this in, on this market on this industry. Um, <clears throat> In general, we are seeing an in, a continued uh, demand for these properties. So mm-hmm. I think that's the baseline: is we're seeing investors continue to push. Um, you know, you almost got to break it down into two, you know, two periods. The uh, the first period was kind of lockdown, quit traveling, readjust your life, and we were all told, you know, stay home. But nobody told you how long you had to stay home. Um, and it kind of got dragged out longer and longer. So yeah. I, there was kind of a shelter in place, you know, what I call the, the fetal position where nobody was doing anything. Nobody knew what to do. Um, and the only transactions that kept moving at that point were our 1031 clients who had a gun put to their head. They had to keep mm-hmm. making a deal. Um, and a few, a few other folks started popping up and saying, hey, I'm looking for bargains. Um, the sellers always, you know, seem to lag the buyers in terms of you know, what we call the ask bid disparity in the world. Um, yeah. Sellers are always looking at the last offer they got or the, their dream number that they always had. And the buyers are talking to lenders today. You know, they're, um, they're checking with their lender, finding out that maybe rates have changed. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very fluid situation. I hate to be, you know, kind of go yep. attorney on you and just say it all depends. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th- there was a point where we thought rates were going to be just rock bottom, incredible, then rates spiked. And, and so pricing does follow rates. Uh, it follows availability of financing, not to get into Chris's points. And, and I'm sure we're all going to talk about this, but I saw rates uh, hit 2.75 and I saw it hit four and a half percent in the last 60 days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's been a little bit of a roller coaster for folks. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, for the most part, my the people that I'm talking to that own these communities, um, this, the community owners that we deal with tend to be long-term holders that didn't have a lot of debt to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you start talking about what's there to stress, uh, I think we've seen across the entire industry, less than 10% default on rent for April. Um, and that would be on the high side. Uh, I would say that the worst hit parks were maybe around 10. Um, I've, I've talked to many, many owners of stable, high quality communities in the Sunbelt markets, and they're literally below 1%. Uh, deviation of vacancy and collections. Most, many of them are telling me they can't measure it. It's it's the same collections as they've always had. Um, so when your business is off somewhere between, call it one and five percent on average, and you have very little debt, there's no urgency. Uh, and I yeah. remember this happened with the last cycle when uh, you know I was in the business in 08, and, um, and I saw, you know, people were looking for bargains, and the sellers just kind of held out a lot of times for the price they heard before. They held mm-hmm. out for the higher number they heard before. Um, in terms of pricing changes now, where we sit today, May 6th, um, there are incredible fin- there's incredible financing out there for the high quality communities. Uh, mm-hmm. So if it's over 50 spaces, it's got off street parking, it's not in the floodplain, and it fits a lot of the boxes, again, getting into Chris's topics, um, it, it, it will go to Fannie Freddie. Um, <clears throat> Fannie Mae Freddie Mac, the agencies for financing. If mm-hmm. it's uh, a lower quality or smaller deal, which you know maybe maybe some of your viewers are, are looking at a 20 or 30 space community in you know a secondary market with some park owned homes, that property is going to be more difficult to sell today. There's I have little doubt about it because what we've learned is the banks have been buried with PPP 
you know, the Paycheck Protection Program applications for the last 45 yeah. days and are just now coming up for water. Now they're looking at their whole portfolio saying, what in my current real estate portfolio is going to go into default? And bottom line is they don't have any clarity. Uh, and I would say that we're going to lose some, some regional and local bank lenders that are normally the, the debt on those deals. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, with um, with some fear in the market, uh, the smaller investors are probably going to be a little less aggressive here for a little while, and pricing may tighten up a little bit, uh, or, or, or may may increase slightly on smaller deals. Mm -hmm. On your institutional size and quality, so again, 50 spaces or more, majority of resident-owned homes, well occupied. Um, I you know I kind of regret to inform a lot of your investors that we're not seeing any drop in pricing in, in, and I'm still hearing from the, the largest institutions in the country uh, that they're still looking to proceed at ridiculously low cap rates. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think we, you know, when, when, if, if we were uh, a company, I think we just got our, our credit rating upgraded to AAA. And I think our competition just got it. Most of their credit ratings just got lowered. Um, I'm thinking manufactured housing and self storage just became the top of the cake, the best, of the best yeah. in terms of lowest default ratios, most consistent. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing the investors know that they're, we're seeing a bunch of folks call us, Hey, we still have money. We're still looking to buy. I've heard that call from, you know, again, some of the largest owners in the country. And, you know, again, I hate to inform them and, and you all that, that you're not alone. Um, there's a lot of folks out there that still have money that are still looking to buy the best mm -hmm. of the best, the stable, high quality stuff. Kevin, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I, I wanted to get some, uh, uh, some additional insight. You, you mentioned ridiculously low cap rates on the higher quality stuff. What, what, give us uh, some better clarity as to what, what's defined as a ridiculously low cap rate on the higher quality uh, parks. What, what, what have you seen them trading at over the last couple of months and ultimately probably where they would trade today based on you know, how far we're into this thing? Right. Um, you know, so again, I, I, the, the thing I learned in OA, uh, I, you know, went full time in this business in 07, got my, got my first listing in 05. So I kind of had the 05 to 07, you know, market was in, you know, high pitch and, and everything was selling. 08 hit and, and there was a big blow up in the financing markets. Um, and I learned that fi financing was the tail that wags the dog. Yep. Today we have more liquidity and, and, and more financing out there for these communities than we had, uh, 13 years ago, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then we became, we've kind of came into our own. Um, you know, if you look at this industry, most of these people who own these communities developed them from the ground up. They developed one or two communities and then they held those for their whole life. And then their kids sell. Them. That's kind of the nature mm -hmm. of the cycle of this business. So 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot of product to, to buy. There's a few folks consolidating it. Today, there's more second generation families that are starting to decide, hey, we, we, we don't want to roll into the third generation or you know, we inherited it and we want to cash out, et cetera. So you're seeing a pick, an increase in velocity of available deals and you're seeing a bunch more investors in the space. So we have, you know, I think by my last tally is probably over 40 groups that would be qualified as billion dollar investment funds or greater. Some of these are $100 billion investment funds. Some of them are $500 billion investment funds, mm -hmm. but billion dollar or bigger buckets of capital. And there's a, 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 a small segment of those 40 groups, which will buy what I call the best of the best communities, which would be, you know, double wide senior city utilities, probably mm -hmm. over, you know, 200 spaces. If you're in, you know, the coasts and you have high rents, that could be over 100, 150 spaces. Um, those would be your institutional quality, best of the best. And what I think is a silly cap rate is sub four. And um, that's where we're at for those best of the best communities. If they're, you know, truly, you know, couponed investments where the homes have value, they're well-maintained, you know, you you can't cut corners in this business and then try to cash out for top dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you've got to invest in your communities. You've got to keep them upgraded. You got to keep your residents happy. And your resident, the biggest measure to me is what your homes sell for. If your homes are selling for five or 10 years a lot rent, that's a strong tenant that's not going to default. If your homes are selling for one year a lot rent and your resident has no equity in their home, when the proverbial you know, stuff hits the fan, people are gonna start walking away from homes. You're gonna see a, a rise in, mm -hmm. in vacancy and, and the cracks are gonna start showing in the low maintenance, high rent, you know, communities. So that's that's kind of the, the separation there. But that, yeah, so to, to answer your, your question, the silly cap rates are sub four. Um, yeah. Go ahead. 
No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I just, I was agreeing with you there. And I, what I do want to, I want to ask a question. You, a couple of minutes back, you, you were kind of giving us, uh, you know, uh, what the national default rates have looked like, or, or I guess delinquency rates have looked like for the month of April across all the different clients you had and the operators you've spoken with. And you'd mentioned that some of the higher grade parks, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the institutional quality parks, some of them are, you know, in the Sunbelt states are, you know, reporting as low as 1% delinquency for the month of April. And so I, I just, I wanted some uh, additional clarity there. Is, are you, most of those 55 plus you know, age restricted communities, or are we also talking kind of lumping age, all age communities into that batch as well? Um, you know, I talked to somebody today with, um, with, an, with an all age portfolio and uh, or, or just a portfolio of all age and senior. And uh, out of 550 spaces, um, he had two people that reported that they lost their jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. and couldn't pay their rent wow. because of that. Or we're looking for some kind of leniency. Um, so that's an example. Um, yeah, I'd say that, that, again, high quality family communities can be in that, that, that bucket. We had another uh, community that we were working with uh, last month that uh, I think, you know, by the 10th of April was something like three collections out of, uh, out of 100 um, that they were outstanding. And they, they actually believed they were going to work it all out by the end of the month. I haven't talked to them since then confirmed, but I think mm – -hmm. Uh, I think I've heard that they've, they've actually collected all those rents by the end of the month. So yeah, there are some well, you know, high quality family communities that are well maintained yep. that do end up, you know, functioning a lot like uh, the 55 plus, you know, kind of four or five star community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. James, I, I appreciate that, man. Very, very helpful. And uh, Chris, I'm going to move on to you next, bud. You're, you're now in the hot seat. And um, uh, being that you handle, you know, the, the lending side of the business, you place, uh, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of million dollars of debt each and every year. And, uh, um, you know, you, you've been, you, you've seen visibility over the last two months as to how that landscape has drastically changed. And so uh, I'd love to hear from your perspective, uh, what have those changes looked like? And maybe you can you know, give some specificity to, you know, the CMBS market, agency market, you know, and then local and regional banks, credit unions, what have you, kind of give us a, drop them in their own buckets and give us a, a clear picture as to um, how each and every one of those different types of, uh, of debt have, uh, have changed over again to the last couple of months. Sure. So, you know, going back to February, we were probably in the most aggressive, most attractive financing environment this industry had ever seen. Uh, we were seeing the effects of coronavirus in China affecting our markets here, not affecting our lives and not, uh, and not anticipating yet that it was going to impact us here domestically. But uh, just that perceived risk had driven interest rates all the way down into the low threes with really no, no reserves, no you know, changes in underwriting requirements. And once we started realizing the impacts of COVID domestically, it just created a lot of uncertainty that nobody could answer, nobody on this panel, nobody, you know, not even our own government could really give us clarity on what exactly was going to happen. And so week by week, we've seen introductions of, of new measures, new underwriting guidelines, new reserve requirements, and we've seen entire programs effectively shut down in our, in our industry. So if we're, bringing it, if we're breaking it down to three buckets, so let's call it agency financing, which is Fannie and Freddie, CMBS, and banks, which you know, could include credit unions, local, regional, national banks. In the agency world, they're still very actively lending. And I would say it's the only silver lining in this whole, you know, in this whole situation is that the government's outlet for pumping liquidity into the housing markets is Fannie and Freddie, on the, especially on the multifamily side. And, you know, we are blessed to be a part of that, of that bucket. Um, generally, I would say that the financing is still very attractive. They have introduced a couple different measures that have made it more conservative and they've had to take measures to de-risk their loans given the uncertainty around how collections are going to be for the next few months. And, uh, and given some of the ancillary revenues that some of these properties generate, like having a retail syrup in the front, you know, they, they've had to change their guidelines. So best way to pretty much sum it up is between Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they've introduced anywhere from six to 18 months of debt service reserves. Mm -hmm. um, in Fannie Mae's case, they're also taking additional one year reserves for, for anywhere from six to 12 months reserves on taxes, insurance and replacement reserves. Um, the idea there is obviously just to make sure that there's enough capital and liquidity available to, you know, deal with any kind of uh, ranges that we might see on collections over the next six months. Um, each one varies in terms of how you get those reserves back. And that kind of speaks to what their foresight for this whole situation is. Freddie has said that as soon as all declarations of state and national emergencies have been lifted for 90 days and they can prove out three months of your property performing as it was originally intended to perform on their original underwriting, 
you can receive those reserves back. Fannie Mae has said, six months after closing your loan, we'll test your, your financials for, uh, uh, on a quarterly basis. And once you pass the debt coverage test for two consecutive quarters, you can take those reserves back. So that kind of speaks to the fact that they don't have any immediate plans to send that money back to you. It just depends on performance. It depends on when this whole situation has been lifted from a few different, uh, from a few different angles. The, the unfortunate part of this whole situation has really been the CMBS market. Um, again, we are lucky that Fannie and Freddie have taken over a lot of the business um, over the last few years, but CMBS is completely shut down right now. You know, that's an industry that's very driven, you know, out of New York. And as we all know, New York is as, as, as on shutdown as any other state right now. And the CMBS markets or the mortgage-backed security markets are, are very sensitive to risk. You know, there's investors on the other sides of these loans that are, you know, responsible for, for purchasing, acquiring these loans. And when they don't have clear sight of, performance on those loans post-closing, they're just not, you know, investing in those loans. So there was a, there's a lack of liquidity in that market to purchase those loans and therefore no, no new loans are being made. Um, we've talked with multiple CMBS lenders on a weekly basis and the consensus at this point is not so much when they're going to open, but pretty much clear that they're not going to be opening at least for the next two or three months. Again, yeah. that's not guaranteeing that they're going to be open in August, but they're telling us it's not going to be sooner than that. Um, you know, 2008 is probably a good time to look back at how those markets were affected. Um, CMBS was completely shut down at that time for, call it two to three years before new origination started taking place. It's, it's a very delicate and very uh, kind of volatile market. And so unless things are very steady and clear, uh, you're just going to see that entire system sort of break down, which is what's happened now. And I would say most of the CMBS markets emphasis has been on asset management, you know, uh, analyzing their portfolios to see how existing loans are performing. Um, again, another testament to our business, all the lenders I've spoken with have said that mobile home parks and self-storage have been the least, you know, called on for watch list, special servicing default ratio so far, completely, you know, opposite of, you know, retail, office, hotels. So I'm pretty sure if the first, you know, wave of CMBS changing back in 2008 wasn't enough, this wave of, of the change in CMBS is going to reassure that their appetites for mobile home parks are going to be stronger than ever. So I do think that our industry is going to come out even stronger in terms of how it's perceived across the debt markets. Mm -hmm. um, going to kind of the, the sort of the most mixed responses has been the bank sector. You know, every bank has the latitude to, you know, have a completely different opinion on how they lend during these times. And for the most part, most banks have told us that they're open to lending, they're open to reviewing deals, but they've really been inundated processing PPP loans, which has taken up almost all of their bandwidth internally. I was just speaking with a big bank in Florida who said over the last 30 days, they processed 10,000 loans on PPP wow. loans. And just, <laughs> and although there's not as much underwriting going into those, that's, that's a lot of transactions to go, yeah. to get through. And so uh, I had sent them an RV deal, you know, 30 days ago, they didn't even respond. Um, and they responded today and said, we actually are interested in, in financing this deal. We just couldn't respond 30 days ago because you know, our heads were in the sand just trying to process these other loans. So I think right now, you know, priority number one for banks is managing their existing portfolios, making sure they're not bleeding in sectors that are that would, should prohibit them from, you know, extending capital in other sectors. Um, but banks are open to lending. It is very relationship driven. Um, and it's, it's, you know, sort of market by market, case by case. Got it. Got it. I appreciate that. And I, I, w I want to, um, uh, you know, uh, dig in a little deeper to the, you know, the, the new, you know, reserve requirements set forth by Fannie and Freddie. You know, how, from a buyer's perspective, you know, how do buyers need to adjust their underwriting, you know, given these changes right now, the reserves, right? And so at some point in time, those should come back to the buyer. However, it has a pretty significant impact on on, uh, you know, on actual cash flow and or, or, you know, return on that particular investment until that money actually comes back. And so how have you seen buyers over the last couple of weeks or, you know, month and a half, what have you, adjust their underwriting to kind of adapt to these, uh, you know, these newly formed changes? You know, on, while it certainly affects the sources and uses and the capital stack on a deal and how much money you either need to raise or invest into a deal, some of that was offset by the fact that rates are so low right now that we're achieving loan to values that we weren't able to six months ago to begin with. So, you know, going back to cap rates, cap rates were, were so low that, uh, you know, six months ago, while interest rates or treasuries were still in the 2% range, we were re really only 
able to borrow 60 to 65% on some of these really high price deals. Um, not because they were constraining your loan to value, but because we were always limited by a 1.25 debt cover. Mm-hmm. Now that interest rates are, and this is probably something good to kind of communicate, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, interest rates are anywhere from three to three and a quarter in most cases. If you're a smaller deal, you're probably closer to three and a half percent. But now that rates are three to three and a half percent, we can borrow more than we did before. And so yet it is getting clawed back in the form of reserves, but surprisingly there's not as much of a net effect as you would think. Certainly at the end of the day, tying up money in a reserve account, that's probably hardly interest bearing and having to raise more money and and pay preferred equity is something or pay a preferred return is something that, you know, could affect your Mm -hmm. models. But I think some of it is offset by the fact that we can borrow more than we were able to before. Yeah, no, good, good, very valid points there. And, you know, I want to speak to, you know, not probably a number of folks that are maybe even, you know, on this webinar, you know, the, the, the new investors, the, the ones that have come in, just come into the fray that are just entering into this industry that are maybe looking to, you know, the purchase their very, their very first park, you know, given, you know, the, the, this new landscape and, and also, you know, the, uh, uh, how Fannie and Freddie are, are taking some mis- risk mitigation approaches to, uh, to lending at this point, do you feel that new buyers are going to, uh, be much more, you know, criticized on their their, bat, their track record, their their history of operating parks if they're brand new to the business. I mean, they're going to have a much more challenging time, much bigger mountain to climb to actually get approved and qualify for financing. And this is assuming that they've got good credit, right? Like they've got, you know, good financials, what have you, but they don't have that track record. Are they going to have a much more challenging time getting into that loan to buy their first property? Yeah, I would say that there's some new hurdles that we've never seen before and, and new line of questioning that we've experienced just over the last week or two. So this is not mm-hmm. something we were even seeing 30 days ago. Um, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are both now asking whether you've requested a PPP loan, uh, you know, payment protection plan loan, and uh, wanting to understand what the need behind that is, understanding global cash flow in your portfolio. Even though it's a non-recourse loan, they want to make sure that you don't own these five mobile home parks, but also own three hotels and two retail strips that you're now not performing well on and, and getting drained elsewhere. They want to make sure that their asset, that their non-recourse collateral or that they, even the carve-out guarantee is is uh, not at risk due to other assets in the, in the borrower's portfolio. So we are starting to see those line of questioning. Um, in regards to, let's see, debt coverage. Yeah, no, they, they are they are absolutely being more stringent right now on, on a borrower's performance. Uh, for the first time in a loan application, I saw credit score requirements, you know, being at least in the upper 600s. Not to say that that's unreasonable, but we'd never seen credit score requirements on loan applications with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, so, yeah, I would say things are tightening up. However, they're still looking to make loans. They just want to make sure they're doing it responsibly because there are going to be people that are they're affected, not just because of this industry, but because of other you know investments. Yeah. Yeah. That, that leads me into another question, uh, you know, re- regarding the, the changing times and, and how, you know, Fannie and Freddie are going to be looking at borrowers moving forward, you know, you know, adapting to these, um, you know, just weird circumstances that we find ourselves in here today. And so, you know, the forbearance program that was offered by the agency lenders, a lot, a lot of folks took advantage of it, you know, even if they might not to ha- ha- you know, needed it whatsoever, their collection was still good, but they still took advantage of it. What do you feel? And, and then you might not know the exact answer to this, but, uh, you know, just given your experience and your time in the business, I mean, what do you feel some of the, if any, some of the long-term consequences might be for borrowers that opted in to one of those forbearance programs now, in, in the future, come time to get a new, you know, whether line of credit or new agency loan, what have you, do you think there's going to be negative impacts or uh, some downsides to those folks that opted into those? Yeah, although it would never, you know, clearly be communicated on the front end that it's a problem. They're, op- they're obviously offering these programs to help accommodate uh, but surprisingly, every owner that's asked us about forbearance programs, and we've encouraged them to reach out to their servicer to request the documents, have ultimately looked through it and decided it wasn't worth it because one, there hasn't been enough of a need where they've actually, you know, lost 20 or 30% of their collections and without a forbearance program, they would be coming out of pocket. So we haven't had that actual situation. And for those that were trying to be preemptive about it, I think they decided that entering these agreements was a little onerous. Uh, with Fannie Mae, there was some strict requirements for how long you can't evict tenants after you enter a forbearance agreement, even after the forbearance agreement has um, has matured. 
And so between that and Freddie Mac has announced a 90 day forbearance program, but I have actually not had a single uh, owner that we finance properties for opt into any of those forbearance agreements yet. So certainly yeah. out of necessity, you know, I think someone, you know, you'd have to consider all your options. Um, it, it could certainly come up in the future with Fannie and Freddie, and I wouldn't put it past them to, to note that somewhere in their system. But um, at this point, they are offering that as an accommodation because, you know, there, there's no certainty two or three months from now what some, you know, properties, you know, how they're performing. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Chris, I, I appreciate that. Uh, very insightful. And Scott, <laughs> you're, you're up, my friend. Uh, you enter into the hot seat. And so being the, the, the appraiser on the panel, um, I'd love to hear from your perspective, uh, any of the material changes that you've seen on, you know, park valuations, right? So we've, we've got one month, April, we're into another month, May, and more than likely there's going to be a, a, a number more months where there's pain felt, right? Where delinquencies are still you know, on the rise, what have you, concessions are being made. And so I'd love to hear, uh, you know, exactly how you perceive the future might uh, look as far as how are you going to look back on like a T12? I mean, is it just going to be, is 2020 going to be X'd out and we're just going to move towards, you know, uh, uh, using a discounted cash flow valuation uh, in lieu of that T12 because there's going to be two, three, four months that are just um, kind of an anomaly. Uh, anyway, I'd love to hear exactly how, you know, the appraisal world intends to handle this, uh, again, very unique time. Sure, absolutely. So we, um, JLL as a firm has been, very closely tracking delinquency and collection loss across the industry. Um, in April, we conducted a survey of about 400,000 sites um, across the United States, and it was a, a diverse portfolio, um, everything from all age to age restricted, you know, the, the class A, four or five star all the way down. Um, and, and just like James alluded to, collections are really strong. Um, age restricted, coastal assets, high quality, um, have, you know, reported very little, if any, collection loss. Um, that's different from what would be normal. Um, I think James kind of, you know, touched on it, but anywhere from kind of one to 10%. Um, obviously there's some exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, collections are really strong across the industry. Um, in terms of our valuations, um, you know, we're, tr we're closely tracking um, sales, but, you know, to date we haven't seen um, the cap rates have really moved one way or the other um, as a result of, of COVID um, and the pandemic. So, um, in, in our valuations, we're really looking at the collection loss, um, if any, um, as being short term. And rather than capitalizing that into perpetuity, um, really looking at it um, on a, a discounted cash flow or if we're just providing a direct cap, really taking a deduction below the line of, you know, some, some short term collection loss that would be there. Very interesting. And, you know, during that, that survey of, of the many different markets across the country, were there any markets that you guys saw that were impacted greater than others? I know that you said the high, you know, high quality coastal communities, uh, what, what have you, were doing great, but are, were there any kind of pockets or, or any specific markets where uh, you see that there was much more of an impact than another? Yeah, there were some markets that are more, uh, I would say, geared towards resort towns where a lot of the residents are, are working at resorts or working at, at hotels, um, certainly were impacted worse. Um, I would say uh, transient RV um, has, has taken a bigger toll on, on collection loss um, and is, is, is just seeing a higher level of vacancy overall. Uh, but generally speaking, it was, um, it was pretty standard across the board. I think the coastal assets were holding up um, certainly the strongest. Um, uh, I think that um, May will shed a lot of light on, on what collection loss will be going forward. And so we're, we're closely tracking that as well. And we'll certainly release some figures once we have them. Um, okay. But that's, that's what we have, have seen to date. Yeah, fantastic. And um, this next question I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, ask you, Scott, I'm going to ask it to, to all three of you, but I, I'll, I'll start with uh, you, Scott, being that we're, we're here now. And, uh, you know, I looked on Amazon, it wasn't available. They're still sold out of uh, the crystal ball. So everyone's bought it, I guess. But uh, in any event, assuming you got one before they sold out, you've got a crystal ball that works. And, uh, uh, you know, what does the future look like? I mean, as far as not, not the future in its entirety, but uh, specifically related to manufactured housing. You know, if you, if you could look out the next six, 12 months and tell me um, what your crystal ball tells you, what's it look like? Yeah, it's um, obviously speculating, but um, I think we've mm -hmm. all touched on it that, uh, that there's huge investor demand for the product type and, and we see that continuing. 
um, over the past three to five years, the the amount of capital that's been chasing the space has, has just been increasing. I'm sure James gets new calls every single day from potential investors or, or equity looking to enter the space. Um, with that, I mean, there's there's a very stagnant level of, of new supply. Uh, there's a lot of consolidation, a lot of aggregating of portfolios, uh, but all of the capital that's chasing the space is really driving up pricing and, um, and driving cap rates down, uh, which is what we've experienced. I think you know, 12 months or, or whatever the timeline is that we get out of the, the pandemic and, and start to get out of it is, um, you know, looking back and this is, this is short-term collection loss. This isn't something that, that, you know, we feel investors are, um, are budgeting for kind of year over year. Yeah, no, I think you made great points there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, um, uh, uh, as a company, we made the decision uh, uh, coming into April that we were, we were literally going to shut down, um, you know, our offices until we could figure out what was going on, right? Kind of get our bearings. We were going to stop all leasing activity, all sales activity, what have you. And just for two weeks initially, it ended up being about three weeks, but we literally had uh, a record sales, uh, a, a record number of sales over the last two months. And it really, it was only like, you know, five weeks of those two months where we actually had activity. I mean, we sold 23 brand new units across our portfolio. And that's actually only a small portion of our portfolio because a, a lot of our parks, we don't have any homes that are even available at this point in time. And so uh, we didn't see any type of demand, uh, downward tick as far as demand goes of folks looking still to buy, looking to move, looking to change locations, what have you. And um, what that tells me is that you know, affordable housing is incredibly strong. I mean, there's a there's an incredibly strong demand today, uh, even during the worst of times, and that 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 demand will continue to grow as time goes on. And so, uh, I I agree with your um, with your feedback there, and um, you know, it's it's a uh, somewhat of a blessing that we're that we are in this niche because it's one that uh, is incredibly resilient, and uh, I think will prove to perform um, both again in challenging times such as today, as well as, you know, great times, which we found ourselves in, you know, prior to this pandemic. And, uh, and so in any event, so I, I want to pass this on to, uh, you know, to, to both James and Chris and maybe uh, James, I'll start with you as far as your crystal ball. And again, you guys have each of all kind of touched on it, but um, again, just tell me what your playbook uh, looks like as far as activity, you know, selling activity, just transactions in general uh, over these next six to 12 months. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there's going to be, again, a little bit of a separating of the quality from the non-quality. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to an operator again today and encouraged him um, to, to go ahead and up the, up his game a little bit, you know, redo your roads, redo your signs, invest in your community. While you're shielded from a lot of the economic impact that a lot of other folks are going through, um, yep. you know, we could be in the hotel space and be 15% occupied or we could be in the retail or office built, you know, space and probably be getting 30 to 40 percent of our rent max. Um, we're really blessed, and I think we should reinvest in our residents, reinvest in our communities, bring the quality of those up. Um, because again, the, the high quality stuff will continue to trade. Um, there's going to continue to be money chasing it. Um, you know, I, I think last month I talked to one large multi-billion-dollar fund. I was very pessimistic about the future, and then I talked to five of them who were very optimistic, and so they're actually allocating more funds to our space. Um, and so, and I talked to a lot of smaller, you know, I guess, uh, operators that are raising money and, you know, within like, there's a one week period there, one guy raised 5 million, one guy said he raised eight digits. So 10 plus, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's going to be money being reallocated to our industry. So specifically to the future of valuations of communities. Um, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got, if you got good product and, um, as long as there's good financing still available, um, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's promising you know, we actually have buyers that buy the highest quality communities and they don't look for financing. They look to write all cash, uh, checks. And so, you know, when you have a treasury yielding 0.6%, um, that is, uh, you know, basically, you, you know, forcing people to go for yield when you have a world that's very uncertain and yield is very scarce. Uh, that's where we fill the, that gap. And so cap rates might continue to compress. Um, I like to think about things kind of from the, 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 the standpoint of the consumer uh, more than even how it affects directly me and, and you and as investors um, or as brokers. Um, you know, I think we are uh, really fortunate again to be in this space. Uh, we are naturally socially distanced. Uh, I had a paper I wrote on the 6th that we, we put out a COVID kind of resource on our website. And I, we posted this paper on April 6th, so exactly a month ago. And uh, I said, hey, manufactured housing and RV resorts are positioned for this. Uh, there was a prediction that came out some, somewhere around uh, three weeks ago that RV sales would spike. 
when the country reopened. And I just got an article today that Oregon has seen their dealers have a, a increased activity with, um, you know, of, of RV sales. So, you know, I, I know this is a manufactured housing focused group, but inherently if you're in the manufactured housing business, you are going to run across hybrid communities or RV communities. Mm-hmm. There's, there's sister asset classes. And yes. so uh, RV, to Scott's point about like what was going on with, with uh, vacancy and collections across the country, um, I saw a lot of RV somewhat affected, 5, 10, 15, 20% business down. Collections, no, they don't have collections really because these people pay by the month. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't even know if the eviction laws apply. It's, 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 it's pretty, pretty uh, it's a lot more lenient. But um, the good news is like one of my clients reopened his doors for short-term stays May 1st. He had 11 people check in the first day and he's up May over May. So your question about how are we going to underwrite? I've been very focused on that. Uh, we have a $16 million Midwest RV portfolio. We're, we're preparing to take the market. We've got an Alaskan RV park on the market. We've got a, uh, another RV park in Colorado on the market. We just closed or we're closing an RV park in Texas this uh, up and coming week. I've got two RV parks in Florida under contract. Um, so as a national brokerage company, I see a lot of RV business and that's the most affected. And I've been telling everybody what's going to happen is, is we're, we're just going to look at how do you do post reopening? So if, mm-hmm. if your state reopens May 15th or May 30th or May 1st, probably give yourself 15 or 30 days to really pick up steam. And then how do you do June over June, July mm-hmm. over July? If t- June over June, June 19 versus June 20, if June 20 is higher than June 19, we're going to throw away April and May. You, you almost, you just have to. And we're going to look at the next 12 months. Hey, business is on track. We got to throw away those few months. And that's, that's going to be the way that the banks are going to have to look at it. The buyers are going to look at it. Um, so yeah, I think high level, uh, I think we're in a good business. We're in the best business to be in. Mm-hmm. Will everybody be affected a hundred percent? Um, I do remember, you know, going through the 08 cycle. I may be, you know, one of the only guys in this call who was in the one part business in 08, um, 08 to 10, we got more homes back. Uh, we had more turnover of in the family communities, especially. So gear up, get ready to fix up homes, fix them up nice, resell them, sell them for more than the homes that are typically selling for your community. Take that oldest, roughest home that somebody walked away from because they lost their job or had to move back home with their family or something and make it your best home in your park. Take it, make it an opportunity to upgrade your park and take this opportunity to make your communities better, give your communities, you know, give your residents more value. That's that's kind of my uh, a prediction yes. and, and, and I'd say my kind of advice. You know, that's great. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, also what I'm hearing there and, and it's one of the questions I'm sure that will be asked uh, from the attendees is, uh, um, you know, will there be buying opportunities, right? I think the, the consensus of what I'm gathering from, you know, each of you that are on this panel is that more than likely there might be some blood here or there, right? But nothing like the blood that other industries such as the, you know, the hotel industry and retail industry and, and office sectors are, are going to see, right? Yeah, that's it, right. it seems that the first things, the first post I was, I was seeing in being of April in my, in my Facebook feed, uh, I'm involved in a lot of different, like, you know, real estate investment groups. It's like, you know, is there opportunities yet? Like, what, you know, where's the opportunity that people are feeling, you know, the pain, the, the, the blood's in the street and what have you. But yeah. um, I'm not sure there's going to be that much blood uh, in, in the mobile home park space. There would be, you know, you know, case by case situations where um, just more probably prone to bad operators than it is the actual uh, parks or the business itself. Um, and so, you no, know, with I that being right. Yeah, and, go uh, ahead. I'll say, um, about that, you know, I think where where I will where I do think we'll see a little little opportunity will be um, in markets where the economy gets bad, home prices, single family home prices fall um, to a, a lower level, so it becomes more difficult to sell new homes in those in those markets. The parks mm-hmm. with 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 expansion room vacancy, um, you know, we've got a park right now for sale in Michigan, thirty percent occupied. You got to fill seventy percent of the park. So depending on where the housing market goes. There's going to be maybe less folks bullish on bringing in brand new $50,000 single wides or $40,000 single wides, maybe $80,000 double wides. That's, I think that the opportunity is going to be in the infill, the, the value add, the turnaround, because again, there's going to be more work involved. If it was mm-hmm. easy to, to turn over homes and sell them and fill new sites, that's going to become a little more difficult uh, in certain markets. I think that where the economy is more affected, like I think Scott talked about the, the hospitality industry uh, mm-hmm. or just soft home markets to begin with. You know, I think that the markets that were the last to rise in this rising tide uh, recovery we had will be the worst hit and the first to fall. And so there may be more opportunity to buy distressed parks that were originally looked at as, as an upside turnaround opportunity. And now people are just people are going to focus more on what's the in-place value of the in-place income. We're not going to pay nearly as much for the upside as we were paying 
in 2019 or 18. Yep. Yep. No, gr- you know, great. Appreciate that. And then uh, Chris, anything to add there uh, you know, related to what the future holds uh, uh, that, that hasn't been mentioned yet? And I second everything that all of you have said. If I had to focus maybe just on kind of the financing aspect of the near future and kind of the midterm future would be rates are obviously not going up anytime soon at this point. You know, for, for years we were communicating to folks that we expected rates to only go up. Um, and because of this, you know, extreme situation. We, I just have no reason to believe that in the next six to 12 months, rates will materially increase. Um, they may even decrease further, to be honest. I don't know that's worth holding your breath, uh, hoping for lower rates, but it's, it's entirely possible that treasuries even tighten further. And so that's going to be, you know, positive when it comes to factoring the cost of money on deals. Um, however, you know, Fannie and Freddie have tightened up some of their credit standards. And that I think, you know, given that there's no CMBS, banks are sort of 50 50 right now and fannie and freddie are tightening up the types of deals that they were taking on over the last two or three years there is going to be just a wider gap between the parks that qualify and then the parks that don't in terms of cap rates the cost of money you know in in acquiring a property like that or even to refinance a property of those sorts um so back to one of james's points i think it's a really important time to improve your properties fix the roads you know, TLC, you know, improve your landscaping um, and just all the aesthetics of your property to have that curb appeal that will meet Fannie and Freddie standards. Um, Fannie and Freddie always had a very precise guideline of what they would do and what they won't do. However, they've made, you know, a lot of exceptions over the last three or four years. And uh, without people even noticing, they were create, you know, accepting all or granting all sorts of waivers and credit exceptions. They're not doing that as much right now. So 85% occupancy is actually very important. So achieving that you know, within the next 12 months is, is going to be important if you're trying to get a Fannie or Freddie loan done. Um, and so after that, I expect CNBS will, you know, will come back at some point here, whether it's in the next six months, 12 months. And when that does, and with the low interest rate environment, given that there was truly never anything fundamentally wrong with mobile home parks, I think, it, you know, the industry is going to be as strong as it's ever been. Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. I, I appreciate it, guys. And so I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and um, g- give some time. We've got a number of questions. I think we've got about 13 or so that have uh, been put up here. And so I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. And let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, you know, the first question uh, is, how does a new investor with limited funds break into this market with the increased interest by more established or funded buyers? And so that, that probably, that question is going to be teed up for, you know, either James, you or, or Chris. Uh, and so as far as like new investors getting in, really being competitive with um, larger operators and, and, you know, professional institutional players, how does one do that? I think you break in um, where uh, anybody should with limited funds, smaller assets, um, you know, as a firm, we try to focus on institutional quality assets. I'd say our minimum deal size, unless you're in the heart of some major metros, probably 50 units or greater. So, and I think that most of the investment funds have a, have a minimum deal size. So you have your biggest investment groups, which may say, we don't look at anything that does less than a million dollars of revenue or less than you know 150 units or 200 units. And then you have each group kind of has a smaller bucket. When it gets down to below 50, you're really competing with your local investor. And so, um, go look, go look in secondary markets. Uh, one thing I've noticed, um, if you are within a, a couple hour drive of where a lot of wealthy people live, you're gonna have a lot more competition. If you'll go out to the middle of the country and you'll go out to, um, farm country or manufacturing country, um, you're going to find more opportunities and, and, and focus on smaller opportunities. Um, you know, those, I think that's a break in, and you know, some of those people, those are very situational because they don't have 15 or 20 people harassing them to sell and brokers like me up, you know, in their ear, they're going to be more flexible. And um, you might be able to get that lovely old couple that developed that park and owned it for their whole life. And, you know, maybe they're just ready to retire. You might be able to get them to carry paper. You might be able to get them to have more of a partnership. Yeah. Hey, I'll lease it from you for a couple of years, add some value and go to Chris, refinance it and and pay you off. Um, you know, so, you know, again, protect that, protect that seller, build an agreement that doesn't, you know, that, that makes them comfortable where you're not going to destroy their business. There's a short leash on it, but you might be able to get some owners to have flexibility like that. I, you know, when somebody calls me up with 10 or 20% down, they want to buy an institutional quality, quality property. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, tough call. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of other folks in front of you with a lot more capital or a lot more aggressive. So I think, you know, add some value, buy some off, you know, off the um, little, little off the beaten path type deals, buy some, non-institutional fixer-uppers, rental parks, meaning parks with a lot of parking homes, that kind of product, 
or smaller, or just highly vacant parks and, and get in there, do some sweat equity. Mm -hmm. I, I, would no, add to that, I would add to that in terms of the capital requirements. And so someone can kind of size a deal that, that works for them. You're going to need at least 30% down. You know, al although we may in some cases get 75 or 80% loan to value term sheets from banks, by the time you're done with all your costs and today's reserves that are required on all sorts of loans, whether it's a bank, Fannie, Freddie, um, or even a bridge investor or a bridge lender, you're going to want to budget 30, you maybe even 35% down built into your overall, you know, funds available. Beyond that, lenders are going to want to see 10% liquidity post transaction. So if you're borrowing $2 million, once you close this transaction, you want to have at least 10% of that loan amount. So that, that could probably help you back into what kind of deals you can afford to take on if you're looking for conventional debt. But I totally agree with, agree with James. If you need to really get creative, seller financing and getting some flexibility from the seller is going to be your best route. Yeah, no, I appreciate the feedback. And, and, you know, the great thing is, is that when you start talking about those types of parks, you know, the ones that don't, that don't qualify for agency debt, uh, right now, a lot of the, the, the banks are just overwhelmed with the PPP loan applications, what have you. And probably a lot of banks are just going to, you know, kind of be a little more timid as well, uh, you know, as we move through these next couple of months. And so what that means, again, when you talk about the, uh, the parks that today don't qualify for agency debt, is that any buyer is going to have the same issue, right, as far as getting you know, correct the right financing put in place. And so, which lends a perfect opportunity, perfect platform to have that conversation with that seller, right? To do something creative, to take a, you know, carry back paper on it or to do some type of um, long-term lease with an option to buy. Because again, if they truly want to get out of that property, every one of the potential buyers more than likely is going to have a challenge unless it, you know, unless it's a cash buyer, what have you. So guys, just for those that are watching that are looking to get into the space, just know that there's, there's still opportunity out there it's just, you're going to have to, you know, kind of pull back the, the curtains a little bit and uh, look where others might not be looking and, and take a different approach or different perspective when, um, you know, when, when, when looking for deals. So moving on here, another good question that popped up. Um, I don't have any feedback on this one, but I'm wondering if any of you uh, here on the panel do. You know, have, have you had any issues with tenants joining together for rent strikes like in apartments, right? There's been a lot of talk about this where May 1st, um, multiple different advocacy groups have been really supporting and trying to, you know, unite folks to, even if they can pay rent, to not pay rent. Have you guys heard any uh, chatter throughout our industry or, you know, specific, you know, operators that have said that they've had tenants band together and do a, uh, you know, a park-wide rent strike? I would say that the leaders of those rent strikes indirectly has been the government. You know, just go yeah. governors and, and mayors all just coming out and, and just really stressing and, and publicizing the fact that there's a moratorium on evictions. Um, but I, I have not seen any owner that we've interacted with that has mentioned that there's any kind of, uh, you know, grouping of the residents to, to avoid paying rent. I, I've not seen an example of that yet. Okay, got it. Uh, got another question here. You know, why is there so little development of new parks considering the amount of institutional interest and what size of investment do institutional clients look for since in many other asset classes, there is a mid market that is too small for the institutions. Uh, that's one of you guys uh, go ahead and grab that if you would. Two part question about why is there no so little development? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll take that and I'll let's got you want to answer the second half. <laughs> um, you know, I think the numbers have been tough uh, on new development. The good news is actually we uh, we've got a, a newly formed equity division where we're placing basically not trying to raise hundred thousand dollar individual investors, but we're trying to marry all the private equity funds who want to get in the space and want to find an operator and marry you know a good operator with a good efficient source of programmatic capital where they can just go out and do deals. And so one of the first, well, a bunch of the deals we've been looking at lately, the new developments. Um, we've got one in Virginia we're working on now that looks like it's uh, green lighted for funding. We actually have a portfolio and uh, got a developer that wants to build maybe 10 in California um, mm -hmm. that we're, the, the capital is very excited about if they can get the government out of the way and get the green light of building affordable housing. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be new product, but for years now, it's been the cost of a new manufactured home with all the regulation that was put on the builders uh, and all the you know, attachments you need on these homes, all the tie down requirements uh, was so expensive that that combined with the, with the lack of good financing for those homes on land lease or chattel financing um, made it you know, not the most competitive uh, position for a developer. And so I think most landowners were just saying, hey, I can put up a subdivision, sell homes out here in a couple of years be done or put up an apartment building, lease up in a couple of years and be done. But if I build a manufactured home community, it's a 10 year 
15 year endeavor to fill this thing. So you need velocity of home sales, I think to be 50 homes a year minimum to justify a new community. And the old days guys are moving hundred homes a year. You can make a lot of money like that. If you're breaking even on a home or even losing a little bit of money, but filling spaces with a $400 better lot rent. Um, the good news is we are seeing some come around. You know, will we ever see the glory days of 700,000, 800,000 mobile homes moved a year, new homes? Probably not. Scott, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that you touched on it. You kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, the one other thing that I would add is, is generally speaking, most zoning jurisdictions are not in favor of new development of manufactured housing. So that's one of the, the biggest hurdles just kind of right off the bat. Yeah. Um, but but second to that is is really what James um, was indicating on absorption rates are really just they're really just slower than where they would need to be. Um, we have seen new development. We've seen a lot of expansion um, for existing communities that have a few acres at the back of the community can fit another 15 sites or 50 sites, whatever it may be, um, and have, have done very well with that. Um, and we have seen some some new development, but generally speaking, it's it's those are the hurdles that are in the way. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. anywhere this is the catch 22. Anywhere that will prove a new community is usually rural and the housing prices are lower anywhere that you could sell homes in in high velocity, your clap, you know, your, your tier one, tier two markets, those, mar those people, the, the building and zoning departments and the government itself speaks out of, out of both sides of its mouth. It says we want affordable housing, but then won't approve a new, you know, affordable manufactured housing community. Um, so that is definitely, I think Scott, I think the bigger point has been in the good markets where you could do it. The government's been impeding our ability to develop new properties, um, you know, which, gets into a whole nother long discussion we could have about <laughs> about their involvement they want to they want to not they don't, they don't want to create any new competition but then they want to tell us what we could charge uh when the market yeah. should be setting prices <laughs> the second part of that question was uh you know i i'm, I'm think I'm, I'm thinking i'm reading this correctly you know what what size um uh, investment uh, do institutional clients look for and so like what is the the, the typical price point is there like a, can we fly below the radar of institutional buyers and, and find that smaller market where we're not competing head to head with them? And if so, what is that? Yeah. I, I think that financing has driven that from in, in some respects. Um, institutional financing or non-recourse financing is available on loan sizes. Let's round it up to about a million and a half and up. Uh, you can get down to a million dollars, but that, that becomes a little, little bit of a grayer area. But anything that's north of a million and a half dollars in debt, so a $2 million transaction, to me has started to become something that's, uh, you know, the type of product that even an institutional buyer will consider, especially if it's a bolt on property or if it's just an absolute clean coupon and they're just looking to continue, continue consolidating. And so once you go below that million and a half dollar loan amount, you're typically going to be financed by a local bank and that's not going to be the type of loan product that an institutional buyer is going to be looking for. Got it. Got it. So right around that million and a half mark or maybe 2 million mark would, if you had to pick a number, that's right where it would be. As far as like what the floor, certainly the bottom of the cusp. James might even say yeah. maybe even three million and up, but you know we'll we'll see even some, some larger buyers look at some two and a half three million dollar deals if they're clean. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it, guys. We're we're right at that eight o'clock yeah. mark. And, uh, can you hear me? I couldn't hear James. He was trying. Got to talk. it. We're right at that eight o'clock mark. I, I want to ask your permission. Do you guys all have ten more minutes? I'd love to get through a couple more questions. We're surely not going to get through them all. I think we still have fourteen or so that are here, and so I'll do our we'll do our best to get through them. Are you guys good with that? Sure. Got sure. 10 more minutes? Okay. Good sure. deal. So I've got another one here. Let me pull it up. And so uh, as far as in industry, uh, you know, we have been highly concerned about top line revenue. However, does anyone see a system wide change in operating expenses? Well, just uh, due to the COVID fallout? And if so, is it higher and or lower? I think they'll drop, <laughs> you know, if nothing else. Uh, if you if, if, if during the period where you shut down all your amenities and, you know, and, and your, your man, yeah, you trying to stay inside. <laughs> um, it's, I think in that period, you'll probably see a reduction in expenses. I think long term, I don't think it'll have any effect on expense ratios. Yeah. Anybody else? Short term, maybe utility expenses could go up. You know, folks are at home more often. So if, if you are including utilities and rents and any kind of services or variable expenses that are affected by people being in their homes more, maybe that's a short term effect. But long term, I don't, I, I can't imagine any other but, effects. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if anything, again, we're talking yeah. minuscule numbers. I mean, we're not talking, you know, major impactful percentages of no. changes. Correct? Sure. Scott, any feedback there? You got any additional thoughts? 
I think that I think that you guys you guys kind of indicate everything that I was going to say. I I do think that it it forced operators to take a look at their business and and probably become a little more tech savvy mm-hmm. to to be able to collect rent and be able to communicate with their residents. Um, so you you might see some um, operators uh, start to kind of upgrade their their business operations that way. But generally yeah. speaking, I think that expense ratios will hold pretty true. Yeah, yeah. I did talk to one manager, one owner who said he's having his manager work in the field all the day, all the time. Now he's, he's got everybody paying via, you know, electronic payment. And so he said, Hey, it gives my manager more time to stay in the field, stay in the park, keep things maintained, keep things enforced. So, but not no cutting, just a, a re re uh, allocating resources from the office to the, to the, to outside the office. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. There was a, there was another question here. I think I can probably address it just being from the, uh, the asset, you know, manager side. And I'm sure you guys have some input as well. And it was, you know, what, what this uh, percentage of renters, um, you know, one to five star, right? The, the entire class uh, of all mobile home park tenants um, use automatic monthly rental payment, you know, ACH, debit card, what have you. Um, really, the question was derived from, the, you know, this, this individual owns a park. Uh, they currently do not use any type of this, you know, any type of digital or electronic payment options. And, but they're looking to make that transition over. And so I can say that we've, um, I can share the stats with us. I've actually got them here uh, as far as where we're at. And it's actually increased over the last two months because we've been really pushing hard for those folks that um, did not have, you know, weren't set up electronically. But even then, um, it's still a very small percentage of our entire portfolio. And so as it sits today, uh, 70% still pay by check or money order. uh, And then 19% pay by credit or debit, and then 11% is ACH. And so it's still a very small percentage of our portfolio. And I'd love to hear from you guys, uh, you know, what you're seeing on, on your side, you know, as far as, uh, um, you know, the clients that you have and that you've uh, represented. Is it much higher than that? Is it lower? Is that kind of uh, in line with the average? I think it's wherever, you, whoever pushes it gets it uh, yeah. to some extent. So the, the harder you encourage it, uh, it's an adaption process. Um, and I think it really depends on the socioeconomic and the kind of the in the general makeup of your community, um, mm-hmm. there are certain groups which are going to be money order groups because they're kind of the, the non-banked, if you will. And um, then there's going to be other groups, senior parks, um, higher socioeconomic parks, which are going to be happy to give you their bank account and let you direct debit them. So mm-hmm. I'd say you know number one, it, it's if you don't offer it and you don't push it, they'll never adapt. Um, yeah. And then once you offer it and push it, um, you'll find that there's certain types of communities that you just can't get them to adapt because their their banking habits. Mm-hmm. Guys, any other thoughts? I agree. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel the same way. So yeah, the second part I, of that- I agree as well. The second part of that question, um, and this is not something that we had done, but it, you know, to incentivize the use of, of going electronic across your, your community or across your portfolio, uh, this individual that's asking the question, they're debating on charging an additional you know, $50 per month fee for the inconvenience of processing a traditional payment, such as that, you know, check or money order, cash, what have you. Have you guys ever seen that on any of the deals you've underwritten you know, to put up for sale? Have you seen, or, or, or Chris, uh, as far as uh, uh, you know, on, the, on the refinancing side or, or financing side, have you guys ever seen anyone um, institute fees such as that to really push the transition over to electronic payments? I've seen it the other way around where there was discounts for paying you know, within the first or second of the month. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. in those cases, I would say that is probably often tied to just being on auto pays. So I haven't seen it directly with, with being electronically enrolled, but we have seen some creativity from one owner to the next on how to incentivize someone to pay within the first few days of the month or just to get them on an electronic ACH payment. Yep. Yep. Got it. Got it. And then let me see if we got any other questions here before we, before we wrap it up guys. <laughs> There's some funny ones here, but uh, uh, this interview has got, he's got multiple, but we'll go ahead and address the one. And um, you know, as a first time investor of a park, would you consider buying a smaller, you know, 15 to 30 uh, site park that is fully rented or at least 95%, you know, rented, but has limited value add, uh, you know, maybe utilities, build back, trash, build back, what have you, if the numbers make sense, you know, that, I guess that's, that's, that's a tough question to answer. It's, you know, my answer to that would be, you know, based on, you know, what your, you know, what are your expectations as far as returns? Uh, I don't know the quality of the park that we're speaking to here. And so um, there's lots of different variables there. And I think they're all, all specific to the individual themselves. Uh, you know, if, if the numbers make sense and I, and they can, and that park can ultimately hit your, your targeted returns and allow you to uh, achieve your, 
desired financial success, uh, you know, by buying that, then I would say, absolutely. I don't see any downsides from doing that. I don't know if you guys have any additional feedback there, but that's a tough question to answer. It's, um, again, there's so many variables there and I don't know this individual and I don't know what their financial goals are. So any other yeah, thoughts? Look, you're getting it. If, 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 if they said the numbers make sense, um, assuming it's full, that it means it's a decent property in a good in a decent area. So why not? I mean, essentially if, yeah. if, if you, if you've got, it's the principal substitution. If you don't, if you have this capital sitting there that's not being put to work and you can make an eight or better percent rate of return there, you're in a hedge against inflation, you're in a safe investment and you can learn an industry and get paid to learn. Um, you know, as long as you're in an area that's got some path of progress, uh, some growth, you should be able to, you know, find some efficiencies, cut some expenses and, and, you know, at least, you know, make a nice cash flow and, and, and improve your, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, probably improve your investment. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And th this one last question here, and then we're going to wrap it up. And uh, I really like this question. It's a good way to end the call out. And it says, how come James and Chris have such good beards? So guys, <laughs> we're, we're, we're in a, <laughs> we're in a situation here where, um, Normally I don't have floppy hair like this. And, uh, I was a little, I was a little delayed on getting a uh, haircut before this pandemic happened. And so I'm, I'm kind of up, uh, you know, issues Creek, you know, as far as that. And, uh, I can't wait to get to the darn barbershop and get a real cut, but you guys have kept it together, seemingly kept it together, nice and polished and, and formed. So, um, kudos to you. <laughs> Chris, you want to take that one? <laughs> I had it first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris did tell me that you guys had a barber. You were bringing a barber into your office to uh, to keep trimmed up. So that's that's yeah. Chris cool. started trying to rent yeah. a barber chair out because we had like five friends who heard we were getting haircuts that lined up. Yeah, uh, so we how desperate know. we all are. Yeah, James mentioned it to one friend. I started getting texts from multiple people saying, "Heard you got a barber coming to your place." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was a mountain man. I actually saw one of my guys. He came in the office for the first time in a month and a half, and I asked him how the set of Castaway was. Because he was definitely on <laughs> Castaway. <laughs> next yeah, next yeah. version. I'm just kind of thrown in the towel at this point in time. I'm just letting it do whatever it does, but uh, I'll be back to normal at some point. But uh, in any event, guys, I, I again, want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate you taking the extra 10 minutes as well. And I appreciate you just, you know, taking time out of your evening to jump on here and, and just share your insights and your knowledge, um, you know, with, with, you know, hundreds of folks that have, uh, that have logged in here. Uh, again, every day is a, a new day and um, the changes are continually coming down the pike. And um, I really look forward to getting back to whatever that new, normal is going to look like. Uh, again, these c coming months are probably going to be trying in many different ways for many different folks. But again, I really appreciate you guys coming on here and just helping give us some guidance, right? You know, help, help at least lighting the path a little bit as we, as we roll down to ensure that we, you know, can uh, make the appropriate financial decisions as we you know, either get started in our business, a lot of the folks that are just getting started looking to buy the first park, or as we, you know, continue to grow our business for those that are already seasoned operators. And so, Thank you to each and every one of you. And, you know, for, for the hundreds that, that, uh, that joined us here, I, I want to thank you, you know, and uh, taking time out of your evening when you could be spending with your family or with your children, what have you. And big shout out to my business partner, Brian Spear. He, um, he was the one that you know, really put all this together behind the scenes. And so, you know, without him, it, this, this uh, webinar wouldn't have happened. And um, just remember that we're going to be conducting more of these town hall events in the coming weeks and months. Again, this is a day-by-day a, a -day thing that we're dealing with here. And uh, every two weeks is what we're shooting for. And so just be on the lookout for the details. We'll be sure to um, do a little bit better job of marketing this and getting it out there to everybody. And um, additionally, if there, if there are any specific topics uh, that you guys would like us to cover uh, or specific, you know, experts, industry experts that you'd like us to have on the show, you can submit those requests or the questions, what have you, to info at kevinbupp.com. Again, info at kevinbupp.com. And guys, thank you again. That's all we have. Enjoy the rest of your evening and um, look forward to doing some deals together in 2020. Thanks, thank Kevin. You, Kevin. Appreciate your host. Thank you, Kevin. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. 
More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.